Committee on Economic Development, Public Buildings, and Emergency Management will come to order. I ask unanimous consent that the chairman be authorized to declare a recess at any time during today's hearing without objection, so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent that members not on the subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee uh, at today's hearing and ask questions without objection, so ordered. As a reminder, if members wish to insert a document into the record, please also email it to documentsti at mail.house.gov. I now recognize myself for the purposes of an opening statement for five, uh, five minutes. I want to begin by thanking our witnesses. Uh, the Honorable Deanna Criswell, the Administrator of the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Ms. Kristen Bernard, the Deputy Inspector General for Audits for Office of the Inspector General at the Department of Homeland Security. That's a long. And uh, Mr. Chris Curry, the Director of Homeland Security and Justice for the United States Government Accountability Office for being here today. I'm glad that's on your card. You probably don't want to say that every time you meet somebody. Today's hearing will focus on examining the propriety of the expanding use of FEMA resources and how it's impacting FEMA's ability to carry out its core mission. Fundamentally, FEMA's core mission is to help people before, during, and after disasters. More specifically, states lead the responses to disaster and FEMA comes in at the request of the state if the state's resources are overwhelmed, or at least that's how it was supposed to work. Increasingly, however, it seems that states are asking for help in more and more incidents that states themselves should be prepared to handle like snowstorms in the Northeast. So we have an increasing reliance on the federal government and then we add that FEMA is also being tasked to manage non-traditional disasters like pandemics and help with issues completely unrelated to its mission or so-called non-Stafford Act disasters. Between 2014 and 2020, FEMA was deployed seven times to address non-Stafford Act disasters. In just the last three years, that has jumped to 16 non-Stafford Stafford Act disasters. These include the crisis at our nation's southwest border, Operation Allies Welcome, Operation Vaccinate Our Workforce, and the list goes on. There is such an increasing demand on the agency that FEMA created a new National Incident Management Assistance Team to respond to disasters that fall outside FEMA's typical mission set. In addition to being called on to address these non-Stafford Act disasters from 2020 to 2023, FEMA also led the federal government's response to COVID-19. To date, as it relates to COVID-19, FEMA has obligated $75 billion in public assistance, $44.3 billion for individual assistance, $36.5 billion for lost wage assistance, and $3.1 billion for the COVID-19 funeral assistance program. Not surprisingly, with all this money flowing out, the DHSIG found billions in fraud and improper payments, sadly. In the Lost Wages Assistance Program alone, the DHSOIG estimated more than $3.7 billion, that's B with a billion, in improper payments. It got to a point that the OIG set up a COVID fraud unit and stealing FEMA funding became a crime of convenience for criminal organizations, including related crimes like identity theft. What's more, FEMA has continued to defend the administration of the Lost Wages Assistance Program, going as far as to say that sufficient, in sufficient internal controls were implemented. The fact that FEMA has failed to implement more controls raises serious concerns about FEMA's recently announced interim rule, which would make significant changes to FEMA's individual assistance program. Some of the most shocking changes, including giving households $750 cash payments, paying individuals upfront for housing options of their choice, and providing upfront payments to individuals who are choosing to stay with family and friends, and I think we'll get into this under a self-certification circumstance. Many of these changes ignore some of the Inspector General's key recommendations to reduce fraud. The question really is, where is the accountability in all of this? Why aren't states doing what they need to do to budget for these costs? Where is the expectation that states, local governments, and individuals carry insurance? How are these added responsibilities on FEMA impacting its core mission, especially since we know from the GAO that FEMA has a workforce shortage that seems, from my count, to be pretty prolific? FEMA can't be all things to all people. 
We have to get a handle on the proper role of FEMA and ensure FEMA's internal controls reduce fraud and misuse of taxpayer funds. I'd look forward to hearing from our witnesses on these issues, but I now want to recognize the ranking member, Ms. Davids, for a five minutes for an opening statement. I yield. Thank you, Chairman. And I, I want to extend a thanks to our witnesses for joining us today to discuss FEMA readiness and the cause of the expanded use of FEMA resources. Climate change and related severe weather events have changed the disaster landscape and strained capacity and resources at local, state, and the federal level. Government and, insur and the insur insurance industry uh, data shows that disasters are more expensive and have greater impact than ever before. To be disaster ready, FEMA must acknowledge the strains climate change is placing on its programs and develop strategies to adapt. The FEMA workforce is the backbone of the agency's programs and is key to enabling proper disaster planning and a successful response in those disasters, but additional work is needed to strengthen that workforce. A recent GAO report found that FEMA has fallen short of its yearly staffing target since 2019. And as disasters grow increasingly frequent and complex, it's important that skilled personnel are, uh, at, are at FEMA to ensure that the agency can fulfill its mission. I'd be remiss to not highlight that capacity challenges experienced by state and local emergency managers whose obligations have been stressed by the increase of complex climate and weather disasters is impacting their communities. Many are managing recoveries for multiple events and submitting reimbursements for multiple federal disaster declarations. Even then, state and local governments are expanding the breadth of tasks their managers are being asked to support it's critical that the federal government recognizes the magnitude of emergency managers' workloads and support policies that are gonna provide adequate funding and resources to the essential workforce. The ultimate goal of our work is to protect communities and to ease the burden of uh, disaster survivors. Natural disasters amplify existing disparities in our society, and it should go without saying that the government must adjust the needs of every American equally during recovery. Some of our most vulnerable populations, however, have been neglected. As such, I commend Administrator Criswell for the publication of FEMA's new interim final rule for the Individual Assistance Program. This rule acknowledges the documented shortcomings of FEMA's assistance for disaster survivors and will help the agency do everything it can to, within existing law to assist um, uh, to close those assistance gaps. But FEMA cannot do everything alone. Congress has to do our part, and I'm glad that we're having this conversation today to better support Americans that have been impacted, both physically and financially, by severe weather events. Administrator, thank you to you and your colleagues for rising to the challenges that our evolving disaster landscape uh, has led to in the increase in scope and complexity of your mission. And I look forward to the conversation today and, and and moving forward with all the witnesses on solutions that are gonna help emergency managers continue their essential work and help guarantee public safety. Thank you, and I yield back. Chair, thanks the gentle lady. And the chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Larson, for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Perry and uh, ranking member uh, Davids. For calling today's hearing, uh, I welcome the opportunity to discuss how Congress can help FEMA better fulfill its mission of helping communities before, during, and after disasters. Talking about non-traditional disasters, in an ideal world, FEMA would have never had to respond to a nationwide, in fact, a worldwide pandemic. But the worst case scenario occurred and FEMA stepped in and responded to the unthinkable, which is exactly what we expect FEMA to do anytime there is a disaster. FEMA's assistance during COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic kept our healthcare system afloat, provided life-saving medical equipment, administered unemployment insurance to help families keep a roof over their head and food on the table, ran vaccine, site, vaccine sites that saved countless lives, and offered grieving families a small comfort through fun funeral assistance. The testimony from the office of the IG says the money was lost, a lot of money was lost to fraud and ineligible payments, and that's true. We've seen that, and we need to, we need to consider that. And it was lost when FEMA administered the COVID-19 relief programs, including the lost wage and funeral assistance programs. Fraud is bad. We need to protect taxpayer dollars. But no program is going to be perfect when you're administering it in the midst of a global emergency and the randomness of COVID, especially an emergency as unexpected and unprecedented as the COVID-19 
COVID-19 pandemic was. At a certain point, it's necessary to step back, see the bigger picture, where scrupulously accounting for every penny of disaster relief can result in such a long and complex process that a single mother struggling to survive is unable to access desperately needed assistance. FEMA has also stepped up when asked to provide humanitarian assistance for migrants. FEMA's role at the U.S.-Mexico border has not undermined its ability to respond to natural disasters. And I support the mission of the Shelter and Services Program, which provides short-term humanitarian assistance, like sheltering, food, and medicine to individuals who have come to our country fleeing violence or in search of a better life. When people are suffering, does America stand by and do nothing? Or do we do the right thing and provide assistance that can save lives? Non-traditional disasters are not the only factor we should be considering when discussing disaster readiness. Climate change is making disasters more frequent, intense, and costly, straining FEMA's workforce and resources. In the 1980s, the country experienced, on average, a billion-dollar disaster every four months. Now there is, on average, a billion-dollar disaster every three weeks. In 2023, the U.S. experienced climate and weather disasters causing $92.9 billion in damage. This data shows that climate change is expanding, is expanding the amount of work FEMA must, carry, uh, must, must do to carry out to fulfill its mission. Investment in mitigation and resilience are proven to lessen the impact of climate and weather-related disasters and should be at the center of FEMA's strategy to assure readiness in this evolving world. Communities are vulnerable. Many infrastructure systems in the U.S. are at the end of their useful life. They are not designed to cope with the additional stress from climate change and extreme weather. That's why I'm a supporter of the resilience investments that we made in the Inflation Reduction Act and the bipartisan infrastructure law. I'm pleased to see FEMA making climate change a central focus of its strategic plan while implementing these bills. FEMA's work is making mitigation projects possible in communities around the country. And funding for mitigation and resilience is not enough. FEMA needs that workforce that is ready to rise to the challenge. The FEMA workforce demonstrated incredibly, um, incredible capability and resilience during the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, but future success in workforce resilience requires adequate staffing. I remain concerned that the Government Accountability Office findings that a 35% staffing gap exists across different positions at FEMA. Uh, I'm concerned about that, and I urge the agency to prioritize recruitment and retention of a resilient and diverse workforce. Diversity is important because it will improve program de delivery and the agency's understanding of challenges faced by disaster survivors across the nation, from rural Texas to northern Alaska to Puerto Rico to Maui and Lahaina, and even in the Puget Sound. The, the BIL made great progress in making our nation more resilient by providing nearly $7 billion to help communities proactively prepare for disasters, maintaining a resilient workforce, incorporating climate change projections into all FEMA's programs, and prioritizing investment in mitigation is key to ensuring our nation's readiness to disasters. And, uh, Administrator Criswell, you have a difficult job. I thank you for your work that FEMA has done under your leadership. Your dedication to FEMA's mission and service to communities before and after disasters is building a safer nation. I look forward to discussing with you and the other witnesses how we can work together to achieve disaster readiness and help the agency achieve its goals. So thank you for being here. Look forward to your testimony and uh, yield back my negative four seconds. Chair, thanks, you, gentlemen. I'd uh, now like to welcome our witnesses and thank them for being here today. Briefly, I'd like to take a moment to explain our lighting sy system to the witnesses. There are three lights in front of you. Green means go, yellow means you're running out of time, and red means it's time to stop. I ask unanimous consent that the witnesses' full statements be included in the record without objection. So ordered, I ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing without objection. So ordered, I also ask unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for additional comment and for information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing without objection, so ordered. As your written testimony has been made part of the record, the subcommittee asks that you each limit your oral remarks to five minutes. With that, Administrator Criswell, you are recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Thank you. Chairman Perry, Ranking Member Davids, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to discuss FEMA's evolving role in emergency management. The committee expressed particular interest in two topics, FEMA's work on the COVID-19 pandemic 
and FEMA's facilitation of migrant-related programs. So I will focus on these in my opening comments. The field of emergency management has changed in recent years as the problems facing communities are more complex and interrelated. And as our field develops, so do the expectations of what emergency managers are expected to handle. COVID-19 is a prime example. On March 19, 2020, the previous administration directed FEMA to assume leadership of the federal government's coordinated response to the pandemic. For the first time in U.S. history, there were concurrent major disaster declarations across every state, five territories, three tribal nations, and the District of Columbia. FEMA rose to the occasion. During the early response, FEMA coordinated with the federal interagency community to help healthcare systems across the country stay staffed and equipped so they could deliver life-saving medical care. FEMA also provided financial assistance to all levels of government to cover critical community services. Fast forward to January 2021, and FEMA's role continued to evolve, now with a focus on achieving President Biden's goal of administering 100 million COVID-19 vaccinations in 100 days. We coordinated with federal, state, local, tribal, and territorial partners to support over 2,100 community vaccination centers, and we were able to put 213 million shots in arms in 100 days, more than double the original goal. In February of 2021, the President directed 100% federal cost share for eligible emergency protective expenses incurred by our state, local, territorial, and tribal partners in response to the COVID-19 pandemic through July 1st of 2022. This included reimbursement for vaccination efforts, COVID-19 screening, and personal protective equipment. The COVID-19 disaster declaration period ended on May 1st or May 11th, 2023, and FEMA is working diligently to complete reimbursement of all eligible expenses. The scale of this historic event required FEMA to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic while simultaneously maintaining mission readiness for natural disasters. For example, in 2021, even as FEMA supported vaccination distribution, the agency successfully responded to Hurricane Ida, the fifth strongest landfalling hurricane to impact the continental United States. The lessons we learned during the pandemic have made us even stronger. I mentioned that FEMA's work on the COVID-19 pandemic began during the previous administration, and the same is true of FEMA's grant work related to assistance to migrants. As you know, FEMA is not an immigration agency or a law enforcement agency. However, FEMA has a recognized expertise in executing grant programs and providing incident management and coordination for both federal partners and our state, local, tribal, and territorial stakeholders. In 2019, Congress directed FEMA to use the Emergency Food and Shelter Program to provide financial support to organizations that provide humanitarian assistance to migrants encountered by the Department of Homeland Security at the border. Congress made additional appropriations for this purpose in fiscal years 21, 22, and 23. In all, $715 million was provided for humanitarian assistance through the ESFP humanitarian program. Through the fiscal, 20, fiscal Year 23 Omnibus Appropriations Act, Congress directed Customs and Border Protection to transfer $800 million to FEMA and transition humanitarian assistance from the ESFP program to a new shelter and services program. FEMA has executed this congressional direction and to date has provided almost $364 million to states, localities, and nonprofit organizations for this purpose. In addition to these grant programs, a limited number of FEMA personnel have intermittently supported the coordination of efforts by the department at the southern border since 2014, including under the previous administration in 2019. At their peak in 2022, these efforts involved fewer than 250 FEMA personnel combined. Regardless of the challenges that FEMA confronts, we will always prioritize the well-being, recruitment, and retention of a well-trained workforce ready to deploy at a moment's notice, 
FEMA is well prepared to execute its powerful mission statement, helping people before, during, and after disasters. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Bernard, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Perry and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here today to discuss the Office of the Inspector General's oversight of FEMA's non-natural disaster programs. As of September 2021, FEMA received approximately $98 billion to assist the nation with the challenges of the pandemic. The sense of urgency, amount of funding, and high volume of disbursements posed unprecedented challenges and risks for FEMA. DHS OIG responded to these challenges and risks with focused oversight, which revealed that FEMA's controls were not sufficient to prevent or deter fraudsters from exploiting FEMA's pandemic relief programs. From fiscal year 2020 to date, we've issued 18 reports on FEMA's non-natural disaster management. In total, we found nearly $4 billion in unallowable or unsupported costs. We also identified $45 million that are funds that could have been put to better use. Our audits have consistently identified the need for FEMA to strengthen internal controls over its programs. Specifically, we've identified four key areas where additional controls are needed to promote efficiency and protect the integrity of FEMA's programs. First is ensuring eligibility for federal assistance. Our audit work has demonstrated that FEMA did not implement or enforce front-end controls to ensure eligibility of recipients, which is a necessary means to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse and disbursement of COVID-19 relief funds. For example, we found that FEMA implemented the Lost Wages Assistance Program without sufficient controls to counter the risk imposed by allowing self-certifications for claimants' eligibility. This led to nearly $4 billion in potentially fraudulent payments, over $21 billion in overpayments, and even $400 million in payments made without obtaining the required self-certifications. Second is ensuring allowability of costs reimbursed. Our audits have repeatedly disclosed that FEMA reimbursed recipients for unallowable costs. For example, during our audit of the COVID-19 Funeral Assistance Program, we found that FEMA improperly reimbursed over $27 million in unallowable costs. Additionally, we questioned over $7 million in funds reimbursed by FEMA for the humanitarian assistance program that were unallowable or unsupported. Third is program oversight. Our audits have disclosed that FEMA did not provide sufficient oversight of its programs to ensure they were meeting their intended mission. For example, we identified over $45 million in funds that could have been put to better use. This stemmed from grant funds for the emergency food and shelter program that were not spent and were never reallocated to ensure that they were timely used to provide assistance for those in need. And finally, the fourth challenge is ensuring consistent data practices. FEMA's inability to provide consistent, reliable data hinders oversight of its programs and operations. In one example, FEMA could not provide us with detailed comparable data across its programs and regional offices which we needed to support our review of COVID-19 funds that have been allocated across six geographic regions. Our audits of FEMA's non-natural disaster management during this time have resulted in 56 recommendations that are intended to strengthen FEMA's management of its programs and operations when implemented. However, FEMA has not yet fully implemented our recommendations. And in fact, as of today, 20% of our recommendations remain unresolved because FEMA either disagreed or hasn't developed an adequate corrective action plan to address them. In addition to our audits aimed at improving FEMA's programs and operations, we also investigate allegations of criminal misconduct. In 2020, in response to the billions of dollars appropriated to DHS for pandemic relief, Inspector General Kafari established a dedicated unit to investigate COVID-19 fraud. To date, our COVID-19 investigations have resulted in 87 convictions and more than $21 million in recoveries. 
These criminal actions underscore the urgent need for FEMA to improve the way it administers its programs to ensure the appropriate use of taxpayer funds. This concludes my testimony. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Ms. Bernard, thank you for your testimony. Mr. Curry, you are now recognized for five minutes for your testimony. Thank you, Chairman Perry, uh, Ranking Member Davids, Ranking Member Larson, other members of the committee. I appreciate the chance to be here today to talk about GAO's work at FEMA. I like to start these conversations always by uh, recognizing the men and women at FEMA and the work they do every day. We get to work with them all the time. They're very dedicated public servants. Uh, I also respect that they're also um, always willing to improve. And uh, before I talk about some of these challenges, I think um, it, that's an important point. FEMA's under uh, increasing pressure every day to do more and more. Uh, state and locals are as well. It's not just the federal level. The reason FEMA is often asked to do these additional things is because they have the funding, flexibility, and the capability to do them often when other federal agencies don't. The bad news about this, though, is that uh, it takes a huge toll on the agency. And I just want to throw out some numbers just to uh, illustrate this. Uh, in 2016, at the height of hurricane season, FEMA was actively managing 30 disasters. In 2023, last year, it was actively managing 71 during hurricane season. Uh, staff deployments have doubled too. Uh, before 2017, they deployed about 3,300 staff a day. After 2017, that's doubled to about 7,000 staff per day. And so this has a huge impact on the workforce. In COVID alone, FEMA had 59 separate disaster declarations across the country. So far, they've spent $123 billion total on COVID, and they expect to spend $144 billion by the end of September, at the end of the fiscal year. So that's more than Hurricane Katrina, Sandy, Harvey, Irma, and Maria so far combined. It's a huge number. And what's happened is this led to a shortage in the disaster relief fund. Last year, as the committee knows, FEMA actually had to put many recovery projects on hold uh, because the disaster relief fund was running short on money. Uh, Congress didn't appropriate the money, but now they're, they're in the same position as they were before. Uh, they now estimate there's going to be a $7 billion shortage at the end of this fiscal year. And I expect this to continue, mainly driven by uh, the higher than expected costs of COVID. While it's hard to exactly quantify the operational impact this has, um, it, it has a huge impact on the workforce. As, as folks noted on the, on the panel, last year we found that FEMA was about 6,000 people short of its goal, its staffing goal. That's about a 65% operational capacity it was operating at. And while FEMA is always going to prioritize response efforts and life-saving efforts, the impact that this has is really on the long tail and recovery projects that FEMA manages. Most people may not realize that FEMA is managing 500 open disaster declarations going back to sometimes 20 years, uh, to Hurricane Katrina still. So it has a huge impact on the processing and efficiency of those operations. Um, according to FEMA itself, it recognizes these challenges. Uh, these shortages have led to burnout and attrition issues. Um, and, you know, part of this, according to them, is, was COVID-19 and the never-ending disaster season that they now face. The last point I want to make is the impact these things have on other parts of FEMA's mission. Um, one consistent theme we've been trying to drive home in the last few years is the need for FEMA to streamline its disaster recovery programs. We hear uh, over and over again from state and locals that we visit that these programs are complicated, they're, uh, they're lengthy, they're very hard to navigate. Survivors are often, um, uh, they're not incentivized to pursue assistance because it's very difficult to get. And uh, this is something we've been driving home for, for a few years now. And it's very difficult to focus on these additional challenges and improving uh, when you're having to constantly react to additional responsibilities on top of additional responsibilities. And some of these efforts are going to require years and years of reform work uh, across the entire country, and it's going to be very difficult. So we think that's a very important goal of FEMA, and they need to continue to focus on. Uh, that's my opening statement. I look forward to the conversation today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Curry, for your testimony. We will now turn to questions, and the chair will recognize himself for five minutes of questions. Um, we already kind of have briefly discussed the ever-expanding role of, of FEMA to include what 
I refer to as non-Stafford Act disasters. And as I highlighted in the, uh, my opening statement, they seem to be increasing every single year. Now, Administrator Criswell, I think that you are dedicated to your mission. I think your, your staff, your employees are as well. And I think that in many cases, um, you've got this huge, responsibility that's that's almost untamable under under your purview and uh, and the people like I said are, are good people that are trying to get the job done you don't have the resources and quite honestly I don't think Congress has helped you very much by throwing more at you um, but you've taken the job so you're gonna have to take the tough questions um, One of the disasters we're talking about is the nation's southwest border. Um, the Biden administration and the DHS sec secretary have claimed there's not a crisis, but obviously it, it's, it's at least invokes some kind of disaster response, right? I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about here. Can you tell us how much money has FEMA spent to address the illegal foreign national crisis on the border? Chairman Perry, thank you for the question. You know, FEMA's role in supporting um, the, the, the border operations has been limited to the grant programs that Congress has directed us to administer. As I stated in my opening statement, it started with the ESFP humanitarian program and now has moved into the shelter and services program. Uh, that is the money that we have committed, is what has been appropriated. So, so how, how much Congress. is that? I, I can get you the numbers and I'll have the staff get you the exact year over year. I know that's uh, available on public record. I just don't have it right now. I mean, I, I, I'm seeing the emergency food and shelter humanitarian is 900 million, shelter and services programs 425 million. The emergency food and shelter itself, I think, is 775 million or something like that. Um, The money that's been spent here, particularly by the charities that make up the board of emergency, the emergency food and shelter program, do, would, you, would you say it encourages, I mean, maybe not by design, but some people believe it is by design. Do you think it encourages legal crossings at the border by foreign nationals? Uh, what I can tell you, Chairman Perry, is that uh, we are facing a broken immigration system. And I understand this, that. This program that Congress has directed us to administer is providing relief to those border agencies, border communities, nonprofit organizations, small communities, to help them with the costs that they are incurring. I understand that, but what I'm saying is, is if you're on the other side of the border and you know that when you come to this side of the border, you're gonna receive, at a minimum, shelter, food, transportation, acute medical care, personal hygiene supplies, and, the, and, and everything necessary to manage to that. Does that encourage people to stay on the other side of the border where they have none of that, or does that encourage them to come to this side of the border where they get all that? Yeah, Chairman Perry, I am not an immigration expert on what the causes of uh, people coming across the border are, uh, but we will continue to support Congress's direction to help support those communities that are experiencing costs. All right, well, I'm gonna tell you that it does encourage them to come. Um, and, uh, and like I said, uh, you, you are forced to, I guess, manage this program, so to speak. Um, if, if FEMA was its own agency outside of the Department of Homeland Security, do you think that it would still be repeatedly be called on to respond to the disaster at the, at the southwest border? Uh, the role of emergency managers uh, continues to get more well understood. And I would say the role of FEMA in our technical ability to provide coordination and collaboration, we provide that level of support to many different federal agencies, not just the department. No, I, I get it. But you have a direct line to the president in, in times of disaster. Correct. Right? You have direct. Otherwise, you generally work through the secretary. Has... Has, have, have you had a conversation with the president regarding your work on the southwest border and the funds that are being expended there? My conversations with the president have focused around the responses that we have been doing for natural disasters. Does it include the border? Just natural disasters. J did you say just natural disasters? Those are the things that I work with the president on. Okay, so, so you haven't had a conversation with the president regarding your role as the administrator of FEMA and the money being spent at the southwest border? I work through the Department of Homeland Security and the secretary. 
but you have ha or have not had a, co a conversation with the president. It should be easy. I, no, I have not had a conversation with the president regarding the border. We are just administering the uh, grant dollars that have been directed by Congress. All right, thank you. My time's expired. Chair now recognizes the gentleman, Mr. Larson, for his questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so a report for FY22 House Homeland Security Probe Creations bill directed the IG to review FEMA's individual assistance program and identify whether recommendations from oversight entities, including them, including the OIG, may have inadvertently led FEMA to develop policies and procedures that are overly restrictive and prevent disaster survivors from accessing aid. Uh, Ms. Bernard, uh, can you summarize the IG's findings and explain how the IG considers hardships, uh, the hardships that disaster survivors are experiencing and the need for quick assistance when issuing recommendations to minimize waste, fraud, and abuse? Certainly, thank you for that question, I'd be happy to. Um, the work that we've done on individual assistance um, has been primarily focused on FEMA's administration of the individual assistance um, programs in terms of its management and oversight. Um, we have not done specific work to look at um, whether the administration was equitable or streamlined but what we have found is FEMA should make improvements to be sure that applicants are eligible for the benefits that they're receiving and that costs are allowable. Were the findings from your review incorporated into recent reports, including the 23 report on FEMA's COVID-19 funeral assistance program delivery? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Were the findings from the review incorporated into recent IG reports, including the 23, the 2023 report on FEMA's COVID-19 funeral assistance program delivery? Uh, yes, we, we did release, I believe you're asking if we released a report on uh, FEMA's oversight of the funeral assistance program, and yes, we did issue you did, findings. And were the findings from the, tw uh, the 22 review, the 22 review that Homeland Security Appropriations Bill asked for, were the results from those findings incorporated into your review? I would have to check to Great, um, make sure. Thanks. I will say, reading your testimony, just read, made me think that we have a pre-COVID-19 set of policies and procedures that we're applying to a global pandemic response, and perhaps they don't fit. Um, but those are the rules and procedures that you have to apply when, in fact, maybe they weren't the best things to apply to a situation where we were all scrambling to a randomness of uh, a randomness that came with, with COVID-19. Um, not, not that you didn't find legitimate fraud, waste, and abuse, but some of your testimony, though, talks about things that maybe in your judgment weren't allowable, but it's not really firm that it wasn't allowable. It's just that you, the OIG made a judgment about things as opposed to put it up against a, a hard metric. Um, I will say in conducting our audit work using the funeral assistance program as an example, we do use our criteria the criteria is the Stafford Act and whether the expenses are necessary or, um, or allowable. So we do have a very specific set of criteria that we're testing against. So I don't, I don't believe the findings are open for interpretation, but FEMA does certainly have the latitude um, to um, issue waivers or um, to interpret its policies. I believe our findings, the key message was that FEMA was interpreting the Stafford Act requirements differently for COVID-19 deaths than it had for deaths from other disasters. So we just asked well, FEMA I, to yeah. um, be consistent in its application of the Stafford Act. I try not to be too flip around here, but to the family that spent $727 on flowers for their loved one's funeral, I'm glad they spent it on that. Um, Administrator Creswell, in uh, 23, NOAA reported that damages, and I covered this, uh, damages from disasters totaled $92.9 billion. Um, can you talk uh, for, for and, and 28 separate climate disasters? Do you believe that, w can you give us some guidance on pre and post disaster mitigation resources and how you would better use them in order to deal with this increasing this frequency of, of extreme weather event and climate change based disasters? 
Yes, Ranking Member Larson, uh, we are seeing an increase in the number and the severity of the severe weather events that we are responding to, which are creating more complex and complicated and costly recoveries. Uh, our focus this year has really been to lift up the part of our agency that does the work before disasters, the before part of our mission statement, investing in our mitigation programs like the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, as well as our flood mitigation assistance and our post-disaster mitigation through the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. These are three programs that can really help communities build to a level of resilience that they can reduce the impact that they can expect to see in the next five or 10 years, even 20 years from these severe weather events that are happening. Um, but we also focus on individual resilience and helping communities become better prepared so individuals know the steps that they need to take to protect themselves and their families in the event that they are in the path of one of these storms. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I yield back. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. The chair now recognizes Chairman Graves from Louisiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Administrator, thank you much, very much for being here. And I want to echo the comments of the chairman. Um, a job where all you do is deal with disasters is, is certainly a challenging one. And I question you and other people's judgment who have taken that job. But uh, thanks for your service anyway. Um, I, I first want to see if I can dispense with two quick questions. Number one. Uh, you and I have had numerous conversations on risk rating 2.0. Uh, I wanted to ask if you would uh, commit to give this committee uh, access to the methodology as, uh, for risk rating 2.0 as well as, as how levies and other protection systems are, uh, are treated in, in um, determining rates. Uh, Representative Graves, uh, we, were, we will be happy to continue to provide briefings on the methodology that we are using for risk rating 2.0. I know that we have provided several briefings so far, but I am so, committed so, to continuing so, so that briefings, conversation. briefings, but not the actual methodology. That, that, FEMA is going to continue to not provide us access to that information. I, I believe that we have shared all of the uh, methodology and the techniques and how we are implementing risk rating 2.0, um, but I am committed in, to In addition to, to how protection systems are treated, things like levies are treated um, in, in calculating the methodology? Can you repeat that, sir? I'm sorry. In, including how levies are treated in regard to how they provide protection or lower rates? They are definitely a factor in the risk rating calculation uh, to determine what the premium is. Um, again, we'll be happy to continue to have these conversations on, uh, on how, this, how the uh, different factors are incorporated into an individual's premium. I, 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 would, I would very much appreciate that. Second one, um, look, the purpose of this hearing is to discuss, I guess, FEMA's sort of expanded role in getting involved in, in areas uh, like uh, d dealing with, with um, illegal immigrants coming into the country and the, and the uh, shelter and housing programs. Um, at home, we represent 750,000 Americans. Um, and as you know, we have dealt with devastating consequences of hurricanes. And I want to thank you for coming down and, and touring the community with us after Hurricane Ida. We still have parishes that still have uh, PWs outstanding for schools. Uh, we have parishes that have PWs outstanding uh, for other public needs, um, or I should say school boards uh, for the schools, particularly in Lafourche and Terrebonne parishes. We have uh, Ashner Hospital System that I think still has like a couple hundred million dollars in outstanding reimbursements under their PWs. Um, they even went back and worked with Rand Corporation to use their methodology for duplication of benefits, resubmitted, still don't have anything. We have Thibodeau uh, Regional Hospital, which is, was the only hospital system that was fully operating in that region during the disaster that still has at least $10 million in outstanding uh, PWs in, in Category B and E, as I recall. Um, can I get a commitment that you will please prioritize the work on actually American citizens and outstanding debts there. This has a profound impact on their ability to provide services, whether it's teaching our kids if they're operating in substandard facilities or, or broken or sharing facilities, as well as our hospital systems. Congressman Graves, uh, that is our priority. The priority of our agency is to assist these communities that have been impacted by the severe weather events as a result of climate change. Uh, administrator, the, so we will continue to prioritize that work. Uh, administrator, I, 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 
I'd, I'd rather if you didn't say continue to because I feel like that it hasn't it hasn't been dealt with the urgency that it needs to be dealt with. And and just going back to the to the comments that the chairman made, as I recall, the the agency has been operating with about 65 percent of of its staffing needs. And and so if you're being pulled into directions that do not prioritize Americans, then then that clearly uh, deprioritizes or it jeopardizes how our own citizens are being treated. And, and so it does raise very significant concerns. Look, I'm gonna say it over and over again. I think as an as a agency of the United States government, we need to prioritize United States citizens and their needs. If our hospital systems are waiting years for reimbursement, if our school systems are waiting years for reimbursement, I, I, I don't think I can go back to people at home and saying, yes, they're properly triaging, the, the, the needs of, of our own citizens. I, I can't do that. And so I'd, I'd just rather if you didn't say you will continue to, I, I just want to ask you to please redouble efforts to address the needs of our own citizens. Uh, I will go back with my team and see if there's anything we can do to expedite some of the program, uh, projects that you have mentioned. Um, but that is our priority. Thank you. Director Curry, I'm out of time, but I do want to follow up with you on better synchronizing uh, HUD and FEMA and other resources from disasters, and I'll do that on the record. Thank you. Chair, thanks the gentleman from Louisiana and it recognizes the other gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Carter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> and thank you to all of our witnesses for joining us today. The ability for FEMA to adequately respond to all types of disasters is a major concern in my home district in southeast Louisiana. The threats to my district and our nation are increasing each year as impacts from the climate crisis worsen, making storms more deadly and weather more unpredictable. Louisiana has witnessed major hurricanes, record heat waves, droughts, wildfires, and Mississippi River levels so low that it threatened the drinking water in the New Orleans and metrop metropolitan area that I proudly represent. Another looming disaster for Louisiana is risk rating 2.0 and the rising cost of insurance, particularly flood insurance. Administrator Griswell, increased rates from the National Flood Insurance Policy Risk Rating 2.0 are exasperating housing affordability issues in my district and may cause homeowners to opt out of the program altogether. In the past, Secretary Marcus has admitted that risk rating 2.0 is in fact flawed and needs some tweaking. What steps has been taken, if any, to fix these flaws and provide affordable flood insurance for all Americans? Congressman Carter, I appreciate our continued conversation regarding uh, the policyholders uh, in Louisiana regarding risk rating 2.0. I think the most important fact that I will continue to talk about is that risk rating 2.0 now bases your flood insurance premium on your actual risk. And so while this does mean an increase for some homeowners, it also means a decrease. In fact, 20% of our policyholders have seen a decrease. However, as you and I have discussed, there is a certain group of individuals that are caught in this, I don't have an expensive home, but I live in this high risk area and cannot afford the flood insurance. And we are committed to continuing to work with Congress on the affordability proposal that we have put forth as part of the NFIP reauthorization we believe this is the best way for people to truly understand their risk, but also have the ability to purchase the insurance to protect their families. 20% decrease, 80% across the nation, 80% increase. I don't like those odds. I, I'm only talking about Louisiana, I, and, and I appreciate your re mentioning a more broader SWAT. But for me and Congressman Graves and the Louisiana delegation, other members that represent areas throughout this country that's impacted. Those aren't good odds for us. And so I, I appreciate that. We're gonna keep hammering home the danger and the catastrophe that it's causing the people of Louisiana. Uh, FEMA, FEMA released a mitigation discount visualization tool for risk rating 2.0, but it does not show in actual dollars how this affects your premium. Can FEMA create a more comprehensive, public-facing premium calculator so policyholders can see their rate fa rating factors and how rating factors affect their annual premiums. Uh, Congressman Carter, I'll certainly take that back to my team and have a conversation with them. I do believe that one of the 
benefits of risk rating 2.0 now is that a policyholder can sit with their insurance agent and put in different scenarios to determine what the impact will be on their insurance premium. Um, but I'll certainly take that back and see what we can continue to do to increase that awareness for individuals to know what will impact their, their premiums. And, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come and further question as Congressman Graves, Congressman Graves just did relative to the algorithm, the methodology. Uh, I think everyone deserves to be able to evaluate and explore how you arrive at these numbers. And I get it, you've tried to work with us and I appreciate that. I know you've got a very difficult job, um, but we do too. And so it's very difficult for us to stand before audiences and, and constituents and not be able to explain what methodology is being used to arrive at these numbers, many of which make no sense to us. So, and I, and I know that it's been asked multiple times, and I know it may be, obviously it's difficult to get to us, but I'd ask you to redouble your efforts on finding a way that we can better explain to our constituencies how you arrive at these numbers. And I've got just a few seconds, so I wanna, uh, after a storm, getting people back into their homes is one of your agency's most important priorities. Sometimes, but not always. FEMA, makes, FEMA can make repairs to somebody's house to get them back in quickly. However, this was often limited to prohibitions of making permanent repairs. How is this addressed in your new individual assistance program through its regulations? So through the new interim final rule, we do have some expanded um, ability to do some repairs to homes, but the Disaster Survivor Fairness Act um, which Congress is moving forward on a bipartisan level, will actually give us greater capability to do direct repairs to homes as well as provide grants to states to help us along the way. I think the combination of both the Disaster Survivor Fairness Act as well as our interim final rule are gonna really help individuals jumpstart their road to recover, recovery in a more common sense approach um, for us to be able to use our funding more efficiently and more effectively. And so the prohibition where a person can fix their home and, and make it even better, but they've been prohibited from doing so because it's deemed a uh, permanent fix. Is that something that's addressed in, this, in these regulation changes? We have expanded uh, slightly the ability to do some of those repairs within the regulation. It will be addressed more fully um, if the Disaster Survivor Fairness Act passes. Thank you, I you back. Chair, thanks the gentleman. The chair now recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Representative Van Orden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Creswell, you mentioned in your testimony that you had several of your FEMA folks working on the southern border, helping with the illegal immigrants, and you said that at one point you had 250, is that right? Yes, sir, at, uh, at our peak, we did not have more than 250 people engaged. Okay, you didn't have more than 250. Okay, great, so what was their, what's their pay grade of those 250 people? I would have to have my staff get back to you. Let's have a look at that, please. Um, so let's just say there are 13s. You got 250, that's $33.5 million. Did you calculate that into your costs of what you expended for the, I don't even know what program that would be. Is that out of the $715 million provided for humanitarian assistance? Did you count the salaries of these people? Uh, the majority of the people that we have sent to support the southern border have been reimbursed to us through the Economy Act by the department. Okay, so they're being paid by taxpayers' dollars. Correct. Okay. Um, how many of these people were working on the southern border uh, immediately following the fires in Maui? Immediately following what, sir, I didn't hear you? The wildfires in Maui, the most devastating wildfire in the history of the United States and the most horrendous uh, tragedy that has ever happened to the... Uh, I would have to get back to you as to exactly how many were there at that particular time, but I can tell you that currently today we have less than 50 people out of our workforce of nearly 24,000. I, I got you, are My point is this. If there is one single member of FEMA working on the border processing illegal aliens coming into the country when our Hawaiian brothers and sisters are without homes, that's one too many. And I think that you've lost your way. Are you familiar with the term mission creep? I am. Okay. Uh, although, as you know, FEMA is not an immigration or law enforcement agency, however, FEMA has recognized expertise in executing grant programs, so you're good at giving away taxpayers' dollars. The expertise that we have, sir, is to bring collaboration and Ma'am, this is your testimony. You are recognized experts in executing grant programs. Okay. 
So you're good at giving away other people's money. And uh, I believe that if I read this stuff and I see how your agency's been working in particular with the Southern border, you're confusing motion with progress. Um, Ms. Bernard, I'm looking at this stuff and I see there's billions and billions of dollars that was fraudulently expended, right? And you say repeatedly, FEMA has interpreted these things, FEMA made these decisions, FEMA decided to do these additional duties. FEMA is not a person. FEMA is an agency. Do you have the names of the individual people that made these, I think, very poor decisions to expend billions of taxpayers' dollars fraudulently? Do you have anybody's names attached to these expenditures? Uh, so if I'm understanding your question, you're asking if we have the names of the, the fraudsters? Um, we do have a very robust COVID fraud unit that's conducting over 500 I see that. investigations. Yeah, I mean the names of the people at FEMA that made these incredibly poor decisions. Because FEMA is, that's an agency, it's not a person. An agency is made up of people that make bad decisions. Do you have their names? Uh, we do not have their names, no, but we have generally across the board made several recommendations for FEMA to improve its ability to get okay. uh, money into the right hands and keep money from the wrong hands. Okay, so you make recommendations to an agency, not individual people, so the individual person is not, they don't even know if they made a good decision or bad? Is that right? I, that's correct in this context, yes. Okay, has anyone been fired for the misuse of billions of taxpayers' dollars to your awareness? Uh, I wouldn't want to speak to the outcome of investigations because we do have so many investigations underway. You can underway. Just say no. To, your, to the best of your knowledge, has anyone been fired for misusing billions of taxpayers' dollars? Um, I wouldn't want to speculate, no. I'm going to take that as a no. Has anyone been disciplined? Uh, again, I would point to our investigative work. Has which... anyone been retrained? Okay, hold on a sec. Ms. Criswell, has anyone been fired, disciplined, or, or retrained for the misuse of billions of taxpayers' dollars? from your agency. Congressman, as it relates to the findings in the OIG reports, uh, and those especially that we have disagreed with, uh, no. Okay, all right. Then how do we learn? We keep doing the same thing. You people are spending billions and billions of American taxpayers' dollars fraudulently. And if I don't know who did it, we can't hold them accountable, and we're going to keep doing the same thing over and over again. This is why people hate Washington, D.C. You people are giving billions of dollars that you throw willy-nilly around because you can, Mr. Curie, and you keep doing it over and over again, and we don't learn. That's why people hate bureaucracies. Ms. Bernard, you need to be empowered. You need to be empowered to recognize individuals, not an agency. And you need to be empowered to, recommendation, to recommend them being fired and held financially accountable and put into prison for fraud. Ms. Criswell, you are the leader. You are the captain of this ship. And if you're not clean in house right now, you are not doing your job, ma'am. Because you've been put, uh, it, you're responsible for billions of taxpayers' dollars and thousands of people's jobs and tens of thousands of Americans' well-being in tragedy. And if you have leakers on your team, it's not going to work out. I, uh, sorry for uh, uh, Chair, thanks my time. Gentlemen. I yield back. Thanks. Chair, thanks, you gentlemen. Uh, Administrator Criswell, you mentioned the Economy Act uh, to, that was used to reimburse. Do you, is there an interagency agreement that Just we can shot. see regarding the, the use of those funds? Is there documentation regarding, regarding that that the committee can, can, can have? Uh, for anything that we would be reimbursed for the Economy Act on, there should be paperwork. We'll be happy to follow up with you. All right. We'll, we, we're going to formally request that at this time. The chair now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Representative Stan. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for allowing me to wave onto the subcommittee to discuss critical issues to my home state of Arizona. Administrator Criswell, when you were before this subcommittee last September, I raised concerns with the implementation of FEMA Shelter and Services Program, or SSP, as you know. Congress designed the SSC program to reimburse local governments and nonprofits that provide essential services to migrants after processed by Border Patrol. But inexplicably, FEMA hasn't prioritized 
border communities while allocating this funding. The Southern Arizona Coalition, a network of local governments and nonprofits, was only eligible to apply for a total of $12 million under this program, a fraction of the total funds available, while New York received 10 times that. It makes no sense. Arizona is on the front lines of the border crisis. In just the first four months of this fiscal year, Border Patrol in the Tucson sector apprehended more than 250,000 migrants, the highest number on record, and now Arizona nonprofits are about to run out of their tiny slice of funding. Last month, I visited Casa Elitas, a nonprofit in Tucson that works with federal law enforcement to support asylum seekers and prevent street releases. They do incredible work, taking in as many as 1,000 migrants a day and providing casework services that help asylum seekers find sponsors, reducing the flow of people seeking services from interior locations like New York. But without additional federal funding, they'll be forced to close their doors. A Pima County executive described what they're about to experience as, uh, experience as quote, homeless on steroids, unquote. I've been calling on House leadership for months to pass additional funds for this program. Mr. Chairman, I ask for unanimous consent to add a letter from the Arizona Border Counties Coalition requesting additional SSP funding to the record. Administrator Criswell, if and when Congress does appropriate additional funding for SSP, does FEMA have a plan to adjust the allocation formula to better prioritize border communities? Congressman, we uh, recognize the incredible amount of value that the SSP program has brought to uh, our border communities. And in the first iteration of that, because of the limitation on time, we did determine to do a direct allocation based on some previous requests. Uh, if appropriated by Congress, our plan is to go forward with a competitive program so we can take in current data and current uh, needs within different communities to help determine the appropriate amount to go to each of the different jurisdictions. Okay, I appreciate you saying that, although I think uh, Arizona um, has dealt with the disproportionate burden and should be in front of the line, if you will, for the next round of funding when Congress does pass additional SSP support. I want to switch gears now to the ongoing effort of the city of Maricopa to develop a regional flood control solution to address flo flooding in the lower Santa Cruz River. In December 21, the city submitted a conditional letter of map revision, a CLOMAR, for its flood channelization project at the time. FEMA estimated that it would be completed within 12 months. That was 26 months ago. Uh, CLOMAR is still pending with FEMA. I am extraordinarily frustrated that the significant delay in advancing this project um, is causing harm to the community. So as the city of Maricopa, as every day goes by, the city remains vulnerable to flooding. Last week, the city met FEMA representatives here in Washington and with Region 9, and I understand they committed to reducing the response time to 45 days and adding consultations to the city to improve communication. I further understand that FEMA acknowledged that delays on the agency's behalf in 2022 contributed to the current situation and indicated that CLOMAR should be completed by the end of July this year. The city values its partnership with FEMA, understands that this is a complicated issue, but it's important to note that an estimated $1 billion in property tax revenue and $50 million in flood control solution cannot be realized until this CLOMAR is completed. Administrator Criswell, can you provide me assurance here today that this CLOMAR will be completed within this recently agreed to time plan? Congressman, I know that our teams have been working with your staff as well as the city of Maricopa. I, I am committed to making sure that we can, can uh, continue this on time, that we can complete it on time. If we run into any roadblocks with that, I'll be certain to reach out with you so I can have the conversation with you personally. I appreciate you uh, doing that. Lack of communication has been a significant issue. The delay has been a significant issue, and it is a project not just important to City of Maricopa, but really the entire Maricopa County because uh, flooding in that area would be devastating. I appreciate your leadership and getting this done. Thank you so much. I yield back. Chair, thanks to the gentleman. The chair now welcomes, uh, first hearing, the gentlelady from Utah, Ms. Malloy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Bernard, Mr. Curry, thank you for the work you're doing to increase accountability and transparency. That, that's really important work. Um, the taxpayers deserve to know how these funds are being spent, uh, and so I appreciate what you're doing. Um, Administrator Criswell, I share the concerns that have already been expressed about mission creep and focus on non-Stafford Act disasters. 
Um, and in the meantime, I'm hearing from constituents in Utah that they have concerns with FEMA that are clearly within FEMA's authority and FEMA's mission. Um, we have flood floodplain maps that aren't being updated. And locals who are reaching out to FEMA about updating floodplain maps and they're having a hard time getting answers. People aren't being responsive. Um, is this something you can help us with? Will your staff work with us on making sure we can get responses? Okay, Congresswoman, I am not familiar with the specific flood maps, but I will certainly take that back personally and talk to my team about the status and what we can do to help them. Thank you. And, and then I also have, can share, have concerns that are being shared with me by my constituents about risk rating 2.0, including that we have homeowners who aren't in the floodplain but are adjacent to the floodplain and their insurance rates are going up so that they're dropping their flood insurance. It seems like that's counterproductive to the mission. Um, so I just wanna echo, Utah's very different from Louisiana, but I wanna echo the concerns by my colleagues from Louisiana that we need to understand the methodologies. We probably need to address the methodologies because if people are dropping their flood insurance, it's not serving the purpose. So will you work with us on that as well? Absolutely. Okay. Then I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Chair, thanks, the gentlelady. The chair now recognizes the gentlelady from the nation's capital, Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> Administrator uh, Criswell, I understand that it is uh, GSA's intention to modernize the federal building at 7th and D Streets Northwest here in the District of Columbia, known as the regional office building to house FEMA's headquarters. How did FEMA and GSA determine that the renovation of the regional office building to house FEMA's headquarters is the most effective option? Uh, Congresswoman Norton, uh, as you know, our lease is coming up in 2027, and we have been working closely with the department as well as GSA to identify the most suitable building for us to move into. Uh, I believe that the building at 7 and D is going to make the most cost-effective use of federal funding by using an existing federal facility. It also provides improved security features uh, to support our staff and our interagency that come together when we activate our National Response Coordination Center. Uh, it's also co-located with one of our DHS partners, and so we'll continue to work with the department and GSA um, as they move forward with this, uh, this move. Uh, what is the timeline for completion of each phase of the regional office building construction, and when do you expect to request, request funding for phase two? I don't have the specifics on the timeline or, or additional funding. I know we've already been uh, appropriated funding for this move, but we'll be happy to get back with you with those details. I'd appreciate that. Uh, <coughs> uh, Administrator Criswell, please provide to the committee in writing within seven days of today's hearing the cost-benefit analysis conducted of FEMA continuing operations in its existing headquarters location under its current lease uh, through purchase of the leased building and for the renovation of the regional office building, if you will. Yes, ma'am, we'll be happy to provide that for the record. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Curry, climate change has fueled an alarming rise in natural disasters with once in a century storms becoming a matter of course. It is critical to invest our emergency management workforce uh, to respond, uh, to invest in that workforce, to respond to these continuing emergencies and to help rebuild affected communities. Yet the Government Accounting Office found that in recent years, FEMA is significantly understaffed falling 6,200 employees short of staffing goals in 2022. Director Curie, what are your recommendations for improving the hiring and retention of FEMA staff? Thank you, ma'am. Um, this has been a historical problem um, over a decade. We've been looking at this, and it, it's been the case over and over again. Why is that a problem? Um, I, I, 
attrition, it's tough at FEMA because a lot of these are part-time positions. A lot of these are intermittent positions, so you can only recruit certain types of people that are willing to fill those. Also, FEMA has told us that there's been a, definitely been a burnout factor in recent years because of COVID-19 and the nonstop disaster season. You know, it used to be that someone would deploy for a number of months, take a break, and maybe deploy months later with back-to-back-to-back-to-back uh, disasters, a lot of times they're asked to deploy sequentially, especially people that have specialized skills and they don't have a lot of them. I think um, a number of things need to happen. Um, one, some steps have been taken through uh, the CREW Act to give FEMA reservists and employees similar protections to like the military reserve would have, where their jobs are secure. I, I think it, those things need to go further. I think there needs to be, almost like the, the National Guard, the military reserve, there needs to be uh, a training component of that when they're not deployed to disasters, a development component of that, a hierarchy structure, a transition structure into full-time positions. So there's more of a pipeline starting early all the way through to uh, the end of a career to where you're not just able to recruit people, frankly, that uh, don't have full-time jobs or have other part-time jobs. Well, what's uh, Administrator Chris Wall, in, in the past year, this year, uh, since the release of the GAO report, what steps has FEMA taken to improve staff hiring and retention? Uh, Ma'am, I really appreciate that question because I just had the opportunity to visit our Center for Domestic Preparedness yesterday. Um, and what I saw there was I had the opportunity to swear in 78 of our new reservists. They come in every two weeks to go through training. And I asked them, how many of them have uh, benefited from a, some of the new programs that we have put in place to include the CREW Act, which we really appreciate Congress's passing of that legislation, as well as some of the incentives for bonuses. And more than half of the individuals in that room have benefited from those programs. Uh, every two weeks, we're continuing to see this. And so those types of um, legislation and new program changes that we have made will increase the most important part of our workforce, which is our reservist workforce, they are the ones that go out to each of these disasters to support them. We'll continue to look for additional ways that we can enhance that level of recruitment as well as retention. Thank you. I yield back. Chair, thanks to the lady. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Mississippi, Mr. Ezell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you to all three of you for being here today. Uh, you have a monumental task, uh, and I have been a recipient of your assistance. Uh, but like everything else, there's always room for improvement. Uh, Ms. Criswell, uh, it's good to see you again, and I appreciate you being here. As you know, South Mississippi is uniquely threatened by major natural disasters, <clears throat> and your agency is responsible for completing many of the recovery projects. One of the projects that I have focused on since my first day in office is addressing the flood insurance crisis. Uh, my constituents, on Mississippi Gulf Coast are being hammered by the unaffordable flood insurance premiums under risk rating 2.0. On top of this, many families in my district are inaccurately included in a high-risk flood zone due to the outdated flood maps. Combining the high rise in flood insurance prices with outdated maps, people in my, in, in my communities are being forced to move. My hometown of Pascagoula has been completely changed because of this. It's frustrating to watch and it's beyond time that we get this fixed. I'm glad that Mississippi State Legislature fully funded a project to update the flood maps in partnership with Southern Mississippi Planning and Development District. This project has partnered with experts in the field to create more reliable flood maps. I understand the group has submitted to FEMA their findings and the data required to revise the flood map for the Mississippi coast. As you can see, this is a very important issue to me and my constituents. You and I both know that the success of these projects relies on good communications between FEMA, the review team, and the local stakeholders. Will you commit to making sure that all the groups working on this project are communicating properly? Congressman, I will personally go back and check in on the flood maps that you just mentioned to ensure that they are being included appropriately into the risk rating calculations for premiums. And I would be happy to continue working with you and, and other members of Congress as we work on an affordability framework so everybody that needs flood insurance can afford flood insurance. Thank you very much. My district is still dealing with projects dating back to Hurricane Katrina. 
And so I'm glad we're talking about why FEMA must effectively uh, use its resources. Uh, this becomes more challenging when FEMA employees are forced to work on non-disaster emergencies such as the border crisis. What is FEMA doing to ensure the agency's mission is not causing further project delays, especially as the agencies work to address staffing issues? Uh, FEMA has been continuously called on for the last several decades in uh, supporting some of the non-Stafford Act events. It's back as far as 2014 um, and again in 2019, and we, we are still uh, being called on to support some of the non-Stafford events because of our ability to provide technical assistance and technical expertise in establishing a coordination and a collaboration function. That is the expertise and the skill set that our emergency managers across the nation bring to the table. That's what FEMA brings to our federal partners to help them with some of these challenging issues that we are facing today. Thank you. <clears throat> Several cities have also complained to me about the long wait times between their request for reimbursement and the time they finally received the federal relief money under the FEMA PA program. These loans can often be outstanding for years collecting interest the entire time. In a high interest rate environment, uh, this is very costly to the taxpayer. If this reimbursement money gets out faster, I believe it would help FEMA and communities save money by ultimately reducing the cost of these loans. Do you think improving and clarifying the interest reimbursement process would help FEMA and communities better utilize resources? No, we do continue to hear um, frustration with the length of time for reimbursement. And one of the changes that we recently made um, last year was simplify procedures by increasing the dollar amount for the small project threshold to $1 million. Uh, that is up significantly from, it was just under $200,000 before, which is the majority of the projects that people are waiting for reimbursement on. Through these new procedures, we feel that we are going to be able to get the reimbursements out into the hands of these communities faster. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bernard, Mr. Berard? Yes, I'm sorry. And uh, Mr. Curry, can you speak about this a little bit? I can take that, sir. Um, in our work over the years, we've been to every state and territory in the country, and um, a consistent theme is complexity of, of FEMA grant programs. Mm -hmm. You mentioned it. I know you probably still have open projects in the Mississippi Gulf Coast and yep. Gulfport and Long Beach. Yep. And I, it's a consistent theme, and I think while there have been some steps taken to reduce some complexity in some of the steps, um, I think, you know, an overhaul of the system n needs to happen in order to sort of re-look re at how we apply public assistance projects. I mean, the way it is now is that you do a damage assessment, and then for years and years later, you're basically going back and forth, back and forth between the federal government and the state and the locality for small changes. Um, that, that's going to have to change. The structure of that's going to have to change if this is ever going to get more efficient. And so I think that's, that's what needs to be focused on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all again for your help and support. You know, we really want to work together to get this done because, you know, ultimately our people are, are, are suffering. And uh, so thank you for, for what you've done and what you're going to do. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chair, thanks, a gentleman. We're going to have a, another round of questioning with the members that are present or still may be present. And I'm going to start, this chair is going to start with himself. Administrator, um, the emergency food and shelter program uh, as I understand it, is, is essentially the money that is allocated is then distributed or decided to be distributed by the National Board. Is that correct? The Legacy Program, ESFP Humanitarian Program, yes. It was an existing program right. that we had that we adapted uh, to meet the original or the initial direction by Congress to administer funding. The SSP program that it has now evolved into will not be. That's, that's a grant program, but I want to focus on the emergency food and shelter program, which does have the board. How many, how many FEMA in, individuals oversee their work? Uh, I would have to get back to you on the number. I know that uh, we have a member of FEMA that sits on the board. Again, this was an existing program that does I'm, meet I'm some not blaming you for needs. it, ma'am. I'm just trying to get clarification, just to be clear here. But yeah, I don't know how uh, many, but I'd be and, happy. And our understanding, just to let you know, it's one, right? It's one person, and you say that one person does sit on the board. This is an enormous amount of money. Does it, since the members of the board also have affiliate organizations in the states and in the various communities within those states, does it seem to be? 
does it seem to you to be a good idea to have this board then decide where the money's going and who's getting it, knowing that in many cases, they're picking their own affiliate organizations in the member states and cities and political, you know, political subdivisions. Does that seem to be, does that at all seem incestuous to you uh, from, a, from a relationship of spending money and, and the fact that the organizations, the members of that board exclusively decide where that money's being spent? Yeah, the, the legacy or the initial uh, an, uh, emergency food and shelter program that we have is one that, again, we adapted to meet the needs of the direction back in 2019. It was an ill-suited program to meet the needs and the scale of the support that we were providing under the humanitarian side of that program. That's why we were grateful for Congress to direct the SSP program as the board no longer has a role in making these decisions. I understand, but this program still exists. It still does has not been. exist. It does not exist. It has the been sunsetted and it is now being replaced by the SSP program. We are still closing out. How much money is left in the program? I would have yeah. to get back with, you with the specifics. All right, I, I would like to know how much money is left in that program and when is the timeline for that to expire? Uh, we will not be doing any new obligations under that program. Everything will fall under the SSP program. And when, when is that going to happen? I understand. The, SS, the SSP program started uh, last fiscal year and if appropriated, it will continue into this fiscal year. Okay. Uh, the Inspector General reviewed 18 audits that they conducted related to FEMA's involvement in non-natural disasters. These 18 audits took place over the past four years. And, and Ms. Bernard, I have $3.8 in fraud, but I think you cited a different number. Um, can, you, can you clarify that? 3.8 is the correct number. 3.8, okay. So Administrator Criswell, uh, sh I mean, apparently, like, I, I, my question kind of was, does FEMA have sufficient controls in place to prevent fraud? But obviously they don't. What, what I mean, I, I'm sure you're taking the recommendations, or at least you're hearing the recommendations of Ms. Bernard, but what, what are you offering in regard to changing that circumstance so we don't see that level? I mean, $3.8 billion might not seem much in the face of $7.2 trillion, but still a lot of money where I come from, and it's still a lot of money to the taxpayers of America. What, what are you recommending be done? Uh, Chairman Perry, we take all uh, concerns about fraud against our programs very seriously, and we appreciate the continued partnership and cooperation with the IG. Again, many of these recommendations we have already closed out, but there are some that we did not agree with the data that they used to provide that. We don't necessarily agree with the dollar amount cited by the IG, but we'd be happy to have um, a session with you in a closed okay. session about our fraud controls. Uh, I, I would like to know to yours. I understand Ms. Bernard's doing it, but you don't agree, that's fine. But what do you, you know, you're the guy, you're the captain of the ship, as one of my colleagues said. Let me ask you this about these self-certifications and the potential for using that in the lost wages assistance program, to me that is rife with fraud and self-certification uh, self is one of the roots of that. Um, are you con literally considering self-certification uh, self regarding the cash assistance, uh, the changes to, to get the individual system assistance program, which would see $750 in cash assistance prior to uh, or upfront housing? Are you still considering self-certification for that in, the, in light of what you've seen in the other programs? So as it relates to the lost wages assistance program that was administered by the previous administration, and I was of course very concerned when I came into this role to learn about the potential fraud. Uh, this was a program that was the responsibility for executing between the state workforce agencies and we continue to work with them to repay us for any of the amounts of money that has been, um, uh, was a fraud. And to date, we have over 165 million that has been returned to FEMA. Uh, as it relates to our new program for serious needs assistance, it's an expansion upon an existing program that we have. Self-certification is just one of many steps that we use to make determinations on whether to issue that money. So you are gonna use self-certification? It will be one of the steps that we will use, yes. 
Well, if you're self-certifying, what other steps would you use that would negate self-certification? We also use identity verification and a number of other things that we'd be happy to provide a full briefing on. So I just want to make sure I understand. So FEMA is saying we're going to make sure that you are who you say you are. That's identification, but still allow you to self-certify in the face of what you just rightly criticized as the previous administration's fraud based on self-certification but you're still gonna use it in this instance, even though essentially what you're saying, we're just gonna make sure you are who you say you are. Chairman Perry, we believe that the, the processes that we are using are sufficient to make sure that we are determining that we are giving money appropriately. We put fraud controls in place and I would be happy to have a separate session with you, not on public camera, about our fraud controls that we have in place. All right, well, I will tell you and my time is way overdue for this round, but. But uh, the self-certification process is very concerning to me. And the fact that we just identify the individual, um, that might be great after the fact to try and go collect that money that fraudulently taken from the American people. But I think the self-certification process, even by your own admission, not that you handled it, that was another administration, is, is, is a problem. And I'm concerned that you would consider that as some kind of reasonable methodology to disperse money prior to, as a matter of fact, um, in advance. In any case, I will yield now to the gentlelady from Washington, D.C., Ms. Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Administrator uh, Criswell, you will recall that uh, I, in my round of questions, I asked you about your recommendations for hiring and retention. Let me ask you further, has FEMA done outreach on college campuses, and what are your thoughts on establishing a training program for recent graduates? Uh, Congresswoman Norton, uh, we do outreach to college campuses. We have intern programs. In fact, uh, during this administration, we have instituted an HBCU and MSI intern program, which we've had several uh, individuals participate across FEMA. Uh, we have a number of ways that we uh, try to create that pipeline for future employees. Part of it can be our FEMA Corps program, which is our youth that are out there supporting us through a partnership within C, as well as through our existing reservists, as, as you heard from my previous answer, um, have been great recruiters for us. Uh, I would be happy to work with you on uh, what type of training program would be uh, beneficial to our employees to retain them and to make sure that they have a career pathway that allows them to be able to succeed within this field. That, that would be very helpful. I, I'd, I'd be happy to work with you. Uh, Administrator Criswell, let me, and uh, Director Curry, this is a question for both of you. What actions should Congress take to increase the emergency management workforce? Want to start? Start. Um, a couple things. I, I think um, we, we talked about how important legislation is because so much of how we recruit, train, and, and deploy our workforce is tied up in the Stafford Act and how that money can and can't be used. A lot of the Stafford Act dollars and disaster relief fund dollars have to be used for a specific disaster. Um, I think there possibly needs to be more flexibility in how some of those monies can be used in blue sky days when there's not a disaster to make sure that we have a constant uh, recruitment, training, exercising, and uh, retention program for our intermittent disaster workforce. Um, I think there's always gonna need to be an intermittent part of the workforce because you have to scale up and down with a disaster, but the extent to which we can um, make that more um, consistent all the time would be better, similar to how uh, we do it with the National Guard uh, and the military reserves. Mm -hmm. that, that's an interesting question, uh, uh, idea. Uh, do you have any uh, ideas, Ms. Griswell? Congresswoman Norton, uh, first off, we are very appreciative of Congress passing the CREW Act, which provides the USERA level protection for our reservists. And it has had a tremendous impact on our ability to recruit and retain a larger number of reservists across, uh, across the country. I do agree with something that Mr. Curry said earlier, uh, that I believe if having been a National Guard member myself, 
uh, having a training academy, training program that is well suited to help individuals enter in and go through the appropriate level of training and having annualized training that uh, gives them the opportunity if they aren't deployed that they can maintain their skill proficiency is a way that we can retain and continue to promote the individuals across the workforce. Thank you very much and I yield back. Chair now recognizes the gentleman, Mr. Larson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm gonna kind of go around the panel here. Uh, Mr. Criswell, just to clarify, does the board exist at all anymore? The board for ESFP? Yeah. The board exists for the pre-humanitarian program. It was the same board that was being used to adapt and deliver the humanitarian side of ESFP. Uh, the original ESFP program still exists and the board is, for, is still there, um, but they are also closing out the original ESFP allocations, and so now humanitarian the, allocations. Yeah, the, so now, so the oversight for the um, SSP, Shelter Services Program grant, then rests with you or rests with FEMA as an agency now? Uh, our grants program directorate will administer it on behalf of the department, and yes, it falls okay. within uh, the grants program directorate now. Just to clarify. Th yeah, thanks. Um, uh, Inspector General Bernard, on the self-certification, uh, you mentioned in your um, in your statement, four and three million payments that lacked the required self-certification. Um, Is the IG making any judgment about this, the process of self-certification generally? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir, we do. And we have, um, we have issued several recommendations for FEMA to just consider how it can better mitigate the risk when it does rely on self-certification. And as you noted, we did find $403 million uh, in costs that had been distributed for applicants without a self-certification as a form of documentation. In, in, in COVID-19, in the Lost Wages Assistance Program? In the Lost Wages yeah. Assistance, yes. And generally, self-certification, have you looked at self-certification in FEMA programs? Generally, is in- Yes, yes sir, we have. So we've conducted four audits over the last few years of FEMA's programs that rely on self-certification. And across those four audits, we've found $10 billion in potentially fraudulent and improper payments. Yeah, yeah. And then as, as a use of self-certification, are there uses for it that the IG says, yeah, that's, it should be used? That's a great question. And I don't think our position is one where we're asking FEMA to um, overhaul its process or replace self-certification. We're just asking for um, risk mitigating steps to consider what else can be done when it's relying on self-certification. And I think the key there is to consider preventative controls. And there are a number of, of um, very timely and free options to help FEMA um, put in place preventative controls. Um, Ms. Curry, what policy changes did FEMA and Congress prioritize though, to ensure mitigation dollars, getting back to the mitigation side of things, are dispersed fairly and to reduce demand for um, post-disaster FEMA resources? Oh, I'm glad you made that comparison because I think mitigation is one of the only options we have to reduce the post-disaster costs um, because we're going to continue to have disasters and the federal government's going to continue to, to pay for them. Um, I, I think, you know, some, some of the things that are being done right now are helpful through like the, the BRIC program. So, you know, over the years we've talked about how little funding actually came in on the pre-disaster side versus the post-disaster side. Now with BRIC you have a lot more available funding. However, you know, when you spread it across the country and all the territories, it's still hard. It's not, it's not that much money per state. So I think, you know, being able to allocate that to the, the, the most effective and most impactful resilience projects is key. And I think these should be the ones that we see the most damage and the most cost on the back end. So for example, you know, in every disaster, uh, the, the electric grid, wastewater treatment facilities, uh, public buildings, those are the big costs. Those are probably 90% of federal disaster, FEMA disaster costs. Uh, the extent to which we can mitigate the, the huge expensive pieces of infrastructure we're gonna save money on, on the back end. Yeah, uh, thanks. And then, uh, Administrator Criswell, uh, 
Ranking Member Titus couldn't be with us today. It was unfortunate because she's long advocated for improving post-disaster housing and outcomes for disaster survivors, and she has the Disaster Survivor Fairness Act to fill in additional assistance gaps for families, and this is on the, um, both supporting and perhaps expanding the interim rule that you all have on uh, individual assistance. Um, so this is kind of the uh, a softball question first, like isn't the Disaster Survivor Fairness Act the best piece of legislation ever, right? That's kind of the- I, I would think so. Yeah, exactly. That's kind of the gist of the question. But I mean, is it your assessment that those reforms uh, would make a, an additional difference and a, a significant dif difference beyond the, the interim uh, the interim rule that you currently have on IA? It, it will continue to expand on the interim rule that we put in place, and it will have a tremendous impact on our ability to actually use federal dollars in a way that makes sense, instead of having them build back to a temporary um, place, uh, only to have to replace it with permanent dollars and permanent structures later. It just makes sense uh, to be able to help people on their road to recovery, gets them back in their homes sooner, gets them out of shelters, out of hotels sooner. So does your interim rule then, in your view, push, uh, allow, does, are, are you allowed to push only as far as you believe you legally can and to have the authority to push with the interim rule and the and the and Representative Titus's bill is necessary to keep, provide you additional authorities to go farther than the interim rule? Is that the interim rule uh, focuses, I would say the majority of it focuses on uh, authorities we have to provide funding for different areas like helping to cover uninsured costs to be able to support rental assistance in a different way. Uh, it has some uh, clarification on how we can build back to a habitable level, um, but the permanent construction pieces uh, that we're talking about really would take hold with um, the Disaster Survivor Fairness Act. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I appreciate that. I yield back. Chair, thanks, the gentleman. Uh, just because of your questioning, Administrator, I, I just need further clarification. I understand the emergency food and shelter humanitarian program is being moved, or the functions of that, over to the uh, shelter and services program under the grant format for for driving that, those those resources out. But the original legacy emergency food and shelter program, which has a board, will remain. Is that my understanding, or am I missing something? So I know it can sound confusing. There was an existing program, emergency food and shelter program, that supported communities across the U.S. with some of their homeless right. populations. That program will continue. Okay. The adaption to that program for ESFP humanitarian has sunsetted, and, and it has been up. replaced with the shelter and services program. So if just for further cl clarification, for the legacy program that exists and has a board, is there anything to preclude those funds that that will come or that remain in that program from uh, anything that will preclude that money to be spent on people existing and residing in the United States who are illegal foreign nationals? Uh, so we have eligible expenses within that program and we reimburse uh, jurisdictions, organizations for the list of eligible expenses uh, that have been identified. I'd be happy to get you a list of what those eligible expenses so, so are. So if you know, and if you don't know, it's okay to say so, but, but that list, would it include, because these are homeless people in America living in Amer some city or some town in America, does it preclude money from being spent on people residing illegally that are illegal foreign nationals in this country who are also homeless? So you're talking about, I just want to make sure I'm clear, you're talking about the original program. Not yes, that has I, I do not know that specifically. I'd have to get back to you. All right, I'd appreciate it if you would. And with that, I want to thank, uh, uh, let's see here. Okay, I want to thank our witnesses and uh, the members of the committee for their participation. I don't think there are any other further questions. So seeing none, that concludes this hearing for today. I would like to thank each of the witnesses for your testimony and for taking the hard shots. This committee stands adjourned.